Hey guys and welcome back for another mystery where today we're going to be talking about the sad, sad case of Kendrick Johnson. You've probably heard about Kendrick's story before and honestly it is one that I've looked at covering before but the case was closed, it felt unnecessary to try and add anything more to the story that's been rehashed again and again. However, on March 10th, 2021, it was announced that the case had been officially reopened on the 5th of March. The Lowndes County Sheriff, Ashley Polk, has said that this is the first time that anyone's had all of the evidence in this case in one place, 17 boxes full of evidence. They're using fresh faces to look into the case, with the key being to not have any predisposed opinion here. It's going to be treated as if it's a brand new case. Sheriff Polk said to Care 11 Alive in a phone interview, I want to reiterate I'm not saying anybody has done anything wrong in the investigation. And he said to AJC, there are no suspects because we haven't made a determination as to whether or not this was murder. This reinvestigation is expected to take months, if not much longer. They've got to go through all of the evidence again. There's a chance they could go through it all and come to the exact same conclusion they did the first time, accidental death. Or they could discover an incriminating piece of evidence that points to homicide. This case is an incredibly divisive one, nobody agrees on any of the evidence, and there's just a poor family who are desperate for answers as to what exactly happened to their son. Perhaps the answer has been there all along, perhaps it was accidental, but what happened defies logic and belief. I'm not surprised that the Johnson family refused to accept the official version of events. I'm not sure I would either. Although I must say, it's hard to know what to believe in this case. I just really, really hope that the investigation is done right this time round without bias, but only time will tell. I'm going to do my absolute best to tell this story from both sides, looking at it all critically. Both sides do have their merits and there's a lot of controversy surrounding this one. And I can't say I have much of an opinion either way here, I don't know which side I fall on, so all I can do is share the information as I found it and let people, you guys, make up your own decisions. 17 year old Kendrick Lamar Johnson was born on the 10th of October 1995 and sadly died on the 10th of January 2013, so over eight years ago now. He was found in the old gym of his high school, Lowndes High School in Valdosta, Georgia in the USA. The situation of his death is pretty much beyond explanation even all these years later. He was found head first in the centre of a rolled up mat which had been placed against a wall. There were 21 mats in total here used for wrestling and cheerleading, all stood three deep against the wall of the gym. They were six feet high and measured nearly three feet across. Kendrick's body was only discovered when a gym class was filling out a survey. Some students sat on the bleachers whilst others climbed on top of the mats. It was at that point when a student noticed a pair of feet in socks inside the centre hole of one of the mats. The teacher of the class, Philip Pipelow, later said in a statement that he was called over by two girls in the class who could see something inside one of the mats. So he reached in and grabbed one of the ankles, expecting a response, but there wasn't one. Him and other students then started to move the mats to reach the one in question and pulled it down to the floor. It was then that Pipelo was sure that the person inside was deceased. One of the students called 911 and emergency services arrived within minutes. Hours before, at about 12.30am, Jacqueline Johnson, Kendrick's mum, had actually reported her son as missing to the police. He was supposed to be attending a basketball game after school and then he was going to call a family member to come and pick him up, but that call never came. It was incredibly unlike Kendrick for him not to come home. He was always home by 11.30pm latest on school nights. And Jacqueline actually ended up driving to the school at around 11pm to see if he was still there. When there was no sign of him, she came home and called 911. The next morning, the missing persons report was filtered down to an officer who arrived at 8am at Lowndes High School to find out if Kendrick had arrived there that day and it was confirmed that he hadn't. 
Jacqueline was also at the school at the same time checking the same thing and she asked to meet with the officer. It seems that the officer stayed at school that morning and at 10.32am was actually dispatched to the old gym for a code blue. It was there that he found students talking about a body and the coach bent over the mat with Kendrick still inside. Kendrick Johnson was the 17 year old son of Jacqueline and Kenneth Johnson. He'd grown up in Valdosta, which was one of the largest cities in South Georgia. I found it really sad that in all of my research for this case, I couldn't find many articles which actually focused on who Kendrick was as a person. It seems he's been kind of forgotten in the narrative of this case, he's second to the story. Which kind of sadly goes against everything Kendrick's parents have been trying to achieve over the past eight years. The most information I could find about Kendrick himself was in an article by Ross Bynum for the Huffington Post. He wrote that Kendrick was the youngest of four children and a junior at Lowndes High School. He was an average student but with a real knack for numbers apparently. According to his father, Kendrick would keep account in his head of his allowance and had stashes of cash saved throughout his bedroom. He'd decided to take a year off from sport, but was looking at rejoining the football team at the time of his death. Kendrick was a quiet, nice, well-liked and responsible teenager. There was nothing to suggest that he'd ever been involved in anything untoward or that anyone had a particular dislike of him. His grandmother called him her peculiar grandchild because he was so much quieter than the rest. Upon discovery of Kendrick's body on the 11th of January, other emergency services began to arrive on the scene. Three firefighters arrived and began tending to his body and not far behind were two paramedics who stated that rigor mortis had already set in. The incident was soon turned over to an investigator, Sergeant Jack Winningham, to begin the investigation. Immediately, a detective was ordered to begin by going to review the surveillance video covering the entrance of the gym. This footage showed that Kendrick entered the old gym at approximately 1.09pm on the 10th of January, the day before. And I say approximately here because the time on the system was not actually accurate. Kendrick was never captured leaving again. They applied for the rest of the surveillance footage from around the area of the school for the 48 hours before Kendrick was last seen, but they were told it would take a few days because there are close to 40 cameras in that wing, and then the investigation didn't receive this footage for several days after the request. A detective did watch a portion of the footage at the school that day it seems, or at least shortly after, and then asked an information technology officer to produce a copy of the surveillance videos for that entire wing. It was delivered on a hard drive five days later. A number of interviews were also held by investigators in these days, with students at the school who were in the old gym that morning, and other people who may have seen Kendrick shortly before his death. I'm taking this information about these interviews from the police reports that are available to the public on the internet, only of course the student names have been redacted. One student said to the police that she had heard that Kendrick had been seen at the basketball game by another student on the Thursday evening at the school, which would have been the 10th of January. But upon questioning that other student, they said that it must have been a misunderstanding. They said they'd never seen Kendrick at the game. Another student said that the last time they saw Kendrick was around 1.25pm near the old gym and Kendrick was acting completely fine. Someone else said they'd seen Kendrick at around 3pm on the Thursday at the lecture hall and they'd had a 15 minute conversation with them. This last interaction isn't captured in any surveillance footage and doesn't match with any other timeline of the day. What we do know is that Kendrick was absent from his next class, the one that would have fallen after 1pm. I think it would have been a weightlifting class. So it doesn't make sense that he would have been chatting with another student at 3pm. At the scene, there were two pairs of shoes found. One were a pair of white and orange Nike shoes that Kendrick's sister soon confirmed as his. They were the shoes he'd been wearing that day, found off his feet, but on top of his body in the mat, resting by his feet. The other pair were a pair of black and white Adidas that his sister wasn't entirely sure about. She said that they were probably his, but she couldn't say for definite. 
On the 17th of January, investigators spoke with another student, a friend of Kendrick's, who informed them that him and Kendrick actually shared a pair of shoes that they used for a gym class and would hide them in the wrestling mats in the old gym, each retrieving them before their class and putting them back afterwards for the next person. This was a pair of black and white Adidas shoes. Kendrick would apparently jump and throw the shoes into the middle of one of the rolled mats. Some sources state that students sometimes use these mats to avoid having to pay a locker fee that they couldn't afford. These shoes were found on the floor where the mat would have been before it was removed by the coach by Kendrick's head. Now these shoes have been the source of a lot of contention in this case over the years, people questioning why there seems to be blood under the shoe but not on it. Was the shoe placed on top of the blood after Kendrick was already hurt or is there a reasonable explanation for this? Blood was also discovered on the inside of the mat, however there was no blood found on the lower half of Kendrick's body nor on the school books that he was carrying. Kendrick was also found to have blood on his face, which the first autopsy would later explain. I say first because there were actually three separate autopsies done in this case. As we've covered, Kendrick was found inside the mat in an inverted position, head first, upside down. The autopsy was performed by the Georgia Bureau of Investigations and it was eventually determined that the cause of death was positional asphyxia with no significant injuries found. According to this autopsy, the reason he was bleeding was due to the blood rushing to his head whilst in that position. It was ruled as an accidental death by the Lowndes County Sheriff's Office and it was hypothesised that Kendrick fell into the mat whilst he was trying to reach for his shoes which were at the bottom. He then got stuck, was unable to get out, and asphyxiated. The sheriff's office said that they never had credible information that indicated that this was anything other than an accident. The entire investigation was just four months long before being closed, and from the very beginning, the Johnson family refused to accept that this was just an accident. They were sure that there must be more to it. It was just so insane. Just the day after his body was found, Kendrick's family actually approached Reverend Floyd Rose of Aldosta Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and he was asked to run an independent investigation into Kendrick's death. It seems that the family didn't really trust the Sheriff's Office in this case from the very beginning, which you probably can't blame them for being a black family. They probably don't have that much trust in the police. And they also soon got in touch with the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People. Lee Touchton, a member of the legal redress team, was put in charge of the NAACP's investigation. So Kendrick's case was being looked at from a number of different angles. And for a lot of months, they did help. But by the July of 2013, so only about five months after Kendrick was found, Touchton resigned from the position. She said she didn't feel comfortable going public and accusing people of murder when she could see no credible evidence of a murder being committed. Reverend Rose also concluded eventually that there was little evidence to point to anything other than an accident in this case. Many people have questioned over the years why these two people seem to do such a 180 on their stances. They went from fully believing that Kendrick was murdered to denying it in just the space of a few months. Many people have questioned over the years why these two people seem to do such a 180 on their stances. They went from fully believing that Kendrick was murdered to denying it completely in just the space of a few months. Perhaps they really did begin to question the evidence, perhaps when they looked at all the evidence they couldn't justify it as a case of murder anymore. However, to this day, the Johnson family refused to accept that. And they may well have a point because there are undeniably things about this case that don't quite seem to add up. Allegedly, the sheriff made a statement in regards to this incident stating that Kendrick's death was an accident incredibly soon after he was found. Certainly not long enough for a proper investigation to have taken place, he seemed to jump the gun a little bit. The statement made by the sheriff at this time, super early into the investigation, was basically what I've already covered. 
the Kendrick climbed the bleachers near the mats and spotted his trainers at the bottom of one. So he crawled into the mat to try and get them out, but got stuck, dying of positional asphyxia. But a lot of people have trouble believing this. Honestly, my main question is why did Kendrick think it was a good idea to dive into this clearly very tight hole head first, instead of just moving some of the mats? It might have taken a second longer, but this was quite a small hole in this mat, clearly smaller than his body. Why would anyone think it was a good idea to dive head first in? Maybe I'm just speaking from my point of view here as somebody who is incredibly claustrophobic, but I do question it. And other people's questions included, why did no one hear him shout for help? And why did nobody see this happening? And you would think as well, if Kendrick's dived into this mat head first, then got stuck, he's going to sort of wiggle around a bit. Why would none of the mats sort of move or fall? It doesn't make sense as to why they'd all be stood there completely untouched. In June 2013, with financial help from the NAACP, an independent autopsy was arranged and Kendrick's body was exhumed. This second autopsy was to be conducted by a Dr. William Anderson, and what he found was shocking, possibly the biggest detail in this case, which makes people question things. The cause of death this time around was not found to be positional asphyxia. It was found to be a blunt force trauma to the right side of his neck, involving the right mandible and soft tissues. It's noted that this is unexplained, apparently non-accidental blunt force trauma. Based on this information alone, it seems somebody killed him. But that wasn't the most surprising thing about this autopsy. It was actually discovered that all of Kendrick's internal organs had been removed. Both his body and his skull had been stuffed with newspaper before his burial. Upon opening his body for the second autopsy, Dr. Anderson found that every organ from pelvis to skull was gone. After Kendrick's body was discovered in the old gym that day, there were two different entities who were thought to have had custody of his body. Firstly, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, who conducted the first autopsy, and then the Harrington Funeral Home in Valdosta, who handled the embalming and the burial. However, it seems that CBS News' Crime Cider did some investigating and found that four entities actually had custody. The two I've just mentioned, and the Valdosta Lounge Regional Crime Laboratory, and a third-party transport company. In October 2013, a spokeswoman for the Georgia Bureau of Investigation called Sherry Lang said to CNN, the organs were placed in Johnson's body, the body was closed, and then the body was released to the funeral home as per normal practice. So the Georgia Bureau of Investigation are saying that they put his organs back, but then the funeral home also denied being the ones to misplace the organs, saying that they never received them. Apparently, when they got Kendrick's body, his organs had already been discarded by the prosecutor, even though the GBI denied this. It seems that a death investigator at the crime lab later, who was present at the autopsy, said that the organs were disposed of due to decomposition, but even then, that was later disputed and said that he was confused, and it seems to this day that the GBI insists that Kendrick's organs were sent with him to the funeral home. Why would anyone lie about what happened to his organs? And why did nobody raise this as an issue, a warning, if they knew the second autopsy was coming? Upon receiving Kendrick's body, the funeral home realised that they had to fill the space inside Kendrick's body, as per standard practice. Usually cotton or sawdust is used for this, but for whatever reason, the funeral home that day decided to use newspaper. Kendrick's family were furious, as expected, saying that Kendrick's body had been treated like a garbage can. Newspaper definitely isn't a standard material to use for such practice nowadays, and according to CNN, the president of the National Association of Medical Examiners had never even heard of this practice before. He told CNN that organs are typically placed in a plastic bag, which is then put back into the body after an autopsy. Whilst individual organs may be kept back for further testing, he wrote that this would not amount to all of the organs in any circumstance I can imagine. 
An investigation into this, into the missing organs, was opened and it was found that the funeral home didn't follow best practice but they were cleared of any wrongdoing and didn't violate any laws by using newspaper. But that doesn't answer the question as to where on earth are his organs and who got rid of them. And questions about Kendrick's organs weren't the only strange thing that arose in 2013. There was also a lot of mystery around the surveillance footage of the school gym on the day of his death. As we know, investigators immediately reviewed CCTV footage that showed Kendrick entering the old gym on the day of his death, just after 1pm. His family waited months to get their hands on this footage though, hundreds of hours of it, 290 hours to be exact, from 35 cameras both inside and outside the gym. But even when they got the footage, this didn't answer any questions for them, it only added to their confusion. So there were four separate cameras inside the old gym alone at this time, but all these four cameras showed were a few collective seconds of Kendrick jogging into the gym. The singular camera that was aimed towards the mat was blurry. And this footage was very strange, jumpy with students appearing and disappearing intermittently, there were also no obvious timestamps on any of the footage, and it was suspected early on by the family and their attorneys that somebody had tampered with the footage, that it had been corrupted. Despite this, the school insisted that the video was a raw feed with no edits, and the sheriff's office said that they didn't edit any files either. When CNN got their hands on the video, they hired a forensic video analysis called Grant Fredericks to look at all of the footage, as well as other footage from the rest of the school as well. Fredericks said that a lot of the Johnson's concerns about this footage were easily explained away. The erratic motion could be attributed to the fact that the cameras are actually activated by motion sensor, and the blurriness in the camera facing the mats was just an unfortunate out of focus lens. And the timestamps apparently were there, just in a place you needed to know to look. But he did discover another mystery about the footage. He discovered that there was at least an hour of missing video from each of the four cameras inside the gym that day, and they were not original files. Two of the cameras were missing an hour and five minutes, their hiatus ending at the moment when Kendrick entered the gym, and the other pair of cameras were missing two hours and ten minutes each, not beginning again until 1.15 and 1.16 p.m. Without a doubt in that time, other students would have entered the gym, but for whatever reasons, the camera's motion sensors didn't seem to be activated. Coincidence or not? Fredericks was only able to find about 18 minutes of video footage of Kendrick at school that day. He walked into school at 7.31am and was last seen at 1.09pm walking into the gym. Some sources quote that he was last seen entering the gym and running diagonally across the floor at 1.27pm, but unless I'm mistaken, it seems the police reports say 1.09. But he was not able to find video showing whether there was anyone else inside the gym at that time, which is vital for the investigation. Frederick said to CNN, the surveillance video has been altered in a number of ways, primarily in image quality and likely in dropped information, information loss. There are also a number of files that are corrupted because they've not been processed correctly and they're not playable. I can't say why they were done that way, but they were not done correctly and they were not done thoroughly. So we're missing information. I don't need to tell you why some people find that very suspicious. In fact, all of this was so suspicious to Jacqueline and Kenneth Johnson that in 2015 they actually filed a $10 million wrongful death lawsuit insisting that Kendrick was murdered and they accused dozens of local and state officials of participating in a conspiracy to cover it all up. This wasn't the first lawsuit of its kind they'd filed either, the first being against the Lowndes County Board of Education, its superintendent and high school principal in 2013, suggesting that Kendrick had been violently assaulted, severely injured, suffered great physical pain and mental anguish, and subjected to insult and loss of life. The lawsuit didn't name anyone specific as an attacker, but suggested that it was a race-based attack due to the fact that Kendrick had been attacked and harassed by a white student repeatedly in the months before his death, 
including an apparent attack on the school bus 14 months before. This 2015 lawsuit was filed in the January, a $100 million lawsuit against 38 individuals, including three of Kendry's classmates and local, state and federal officials. The school superintendent of Lowndes County, the Valdosta Lowndes Crime Lab, the police chief of Valdosta, a number of sheriff's deputies, the city of Valdosta itself, the state medical examiner, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, and five agents and an FBI agent. This lawsuit alleged that this FBI agent ordered his two sons and a classmate to attack Hendrick and then helped cover it up. In November 2015, the Department of Justice, who had started to investigate this case back in October 2013, filed a motion in this civil case to intervene and stay the case. Basically, they said that allowing evidence to be shown in the wrongful death civil suit would have a negative effect on the federal investigation they were conducting. Basically, the civil case was bad. Their request here was denied, so Jacqueline and Kenneth actually decided to dismiss their lawsuit, saying they would instead refile it after the Department of Justice investigation had concluded, which it eventually would do in June 2016. They said in an official statement on the justice.gov website, after extensive investigation into this tragic event, federal investigators determined there is insufficient evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that someone or some group of people willfully violated Kendrick Johnson's civil rights or committed any other prosecutable federal crime. Accordingly, the investigation into this incident has been closed without the filing of federal criminal charges. More information around the accusation made in this wrongful death lawsuit didn't really come out until 2018 when an affidavit was filed, which just so happened to be two days before the Johnsons were due to pay some pretty hefty attorney's fees. In this affidavit, a witness gave testimony stating that an acquaintance had confessed to them, saying that they knew another person had killed Kendrick, a person they'd met once in April 2016. According to this redacted affidavit, this person states the death came about after an argument between Kendrick and his killer in the old gym. Apparently the killer was taking steroids at the time and as a result of roid rage or other side effects of the steroids, they struck Kendrick in the neck with a 45 pound weight or dumbbell. Apparently the perpetrator told the person in the affidavit that they thought the blow may have broken Kendrick's neck. There were also apparently witnesses to all of this who were threatened to help move Kendrick's body and stay silent. Point eight of this affidavit even mentions the aforementioned issue with the surveillance footage. It states that this person was told that another person facilitated in the editing of the surveillance footage by corrupting or deleting some one hour and 25 minutes of the original recording. It also says after Kendrick's death, his organs were removed and newspapers were placed in the cavity in an attempt to interfere with efforts to establish the correct time of death or disclose any other injuries. We'll be going into this in more detail in just a moment, but first I want to cover the findings of yet another autopsy, autopsy number three. Despite the findings of the second autopsy that Kendrick had died due to non-accidental blunt force trauma, not much was really done about it. So little that in June 2018 it was announced that Kendrick's body was set to be exhumed once again for a third autopsy. The autopsy was held again by Dr Anderson and the report remained pretty much the same except for a short addendum. In addition to the blunt force trauma on the right side of his neck as noted in the second autopsy, this time it was also noted that Kendrick had blunt force trauma to the right thorax as well, which is the part of the body between the neck and the abdomen. Once again it stated that the pulmonary findings are consistent with rapid onset death and the findings are not consistent with positional asphyxia. Based on this evidence, the Johnsons are just further convinced that their son was murdered and they think they know who did it. So this is where we talk about the Johnsons main suspects in this case. I say the Johnsons main suspects because investigators have since dismissed this theory, they say they're completely innocent. The affidavit I detailed just a second ago was actually given by a 27 year old man from Valdosta called Ryan Anthony Domek Hernandez. 
It's probably worth noting that Hayes was named quite well known to law enforcement in the area. According to Valdosta Today, he'd previously been arrested for burglary, possession of marijuana, possession of meth and a criminal trespass. In August 2018, he was arrested for trespass once again when a woman told police that she was in her bathroom and someone came to the window and punched through it in an attempt to enter the house. The man left the scene but then went to a local medical centre for treatment for his bleeding hand, where officers overheard him trying to register at the front desk as John Doe. After a small scuffle, he was taken to Lowndes County Jail and was later released on bond. And this didn't happen long after the affidavit had been released, and Jacqueline would go to Facebook to say that he'd apparently been jailed on bogus charges to suppress the statement he'd made in the affidavit. Although it does seem that he did actually commit this particular crime, so I'm not sure that claim is all that legitimate. Over the years, Jacqueline and Kenneth have made a lot of claims via rallies they've held for Kendrick's death and via Facebook, some which have some basis and some which don't really. So it later came out that the people Domek Hernandez accused in his affidavit were a family called the Bell family. Brothers Brian and Brandon Bell and their father, Ryan Bell, an FBI agent. In the affidavit, Domek Hernandez says that he was at Brandon Bell's apartment in Jacksonville, Florida in April 2013, and that Brandon is the one who admitted everything that we heard in the statement. According to this, Brian was the one who killed Kendrick, that Brandon, Brian and another friend of theirs called Ryan Hall had been arguing with Kendrick in the gym that day. Allegedly, Brian struck Kendrick with a dumbbell during a roid rage and threatened Ryan to keep quiet. The brothers then allegedly told their father Rick Bell what had happened, so he contacted the Lowndes County Sheriff Chris Prime. Prime then met with the county coroner to cover this up, an unnamed FBI agent then altered the surveillance footage, and Kendrick's organs were removed to obscure his time of death and his autopsy records were falsified. All of this, which came out in 2018, matched up with previous allegations that Johnsons had made in their civil suits. Now, I think if you're new to true crime, you probably immediately dismiss all of this. This sounds like the plot of a movie, right? That doesn't actually happen in real life. But having covered some of the cases that I've covered in the past, knowing what I know now about how far some people will go to conceal a crime and cover up for their loved ones, I wouldn't necessarily immediately dismiss this story as false. It's definitely something which could be possible under the correct circumstances. But is it what really happened in this case? Well, it seems that most of the claims around this theory have all been discredited, and even discredited before the affidavit. On the 19th of November 2013, an article was published on ebony.com in which they accused an FBI agent and his sons of Kendrick's murder and subsequent cover-up. And the reason for the murder was that Kendrick had allegedly slept with one of the brother's girlfriends. This article didn't name anyone directly, but instead used these thinly veiled pseudonyms which are pretty easily uncovered by those close to the case. Everyone at Lowndes High School knew to whom the article was referring, the Bells. All of this, the accusations, had really come to head about four and a half years before the affidavit came to light publicly. And according to the Valdosta Daily Times, the Bells had already filed a $5 million defamation lawsuit against the publisher of Ebony Magazine and the writer of the story, Frederick Rosen. Apparently, as a result of the article and others which were also written, Brian and Brandon were threatened with bodily harm and were ostracised by other students, in person and on social media. Apparently, all the article was based on in the first place was an anonymous email sent to the Lowndes County Sheriff's Office and ebony.com just ran with it. The ebony.com articles began in the August of 2013, with an article stating that Kendrick had been murdered. Although, as we know by this point, the death had already been noted as positional asphyxia, a tragic accident. And then more articles followed, talking about the fight Kendrick had had on the bus with another student 14 months before his death. We now know that said argument was with Brian Bell. But according to an article on itgnext.com, this was little more than a minor altercation. The two apparently remained friends afterwards, and it was just as much as I hate the phrase, 
boys being boys. From there, the website went to accuse Chris and Clark Martin, which were pseudonyms for Brian and Brandon Bell. The only thing Rosen changed in the articles were the boys' names. Everything else remained the same. The FBI father, the fight. But was there anything to the accusations? And why did Ebony.com and the Johnsons seem so convinced that the Bells were involved in Kendrick's death with seemingly no evidence of this? It does seem to me like one of the main factors behind this was the scuffle on the bus over a year beforehand. But there's also the fact that allegedly Brandon Bell got drunk at a party on the 4th of July 2013 and told people that his brother was responsible for Kendrick's death. In the police reports for this case, I could also see that there was reportedly a post made on Facebook on the 11th of January, which was the same day as Kendrick's body was discovered, in which a student said something along the lines of, when you start messing the goons, bodies start showing up. The Facebook account was soon deactivated, so this could never be confirmed, but people did report it. Apparently, this might have been tied to a group that Kendrick was a part of, called the CBC or the Clientville Click, and people had been feuding with members of CBC over a rival member's girlfriend. Apparently the poster of this status was even jumped in the street that night, being accused of Kendrick's death. Although according to the Valdosta Daily Times, this is disputed. It's easy to assume that this post might have been made by one of the Bell brothers, particularly because of the inferences to a girlfriend cheating them with Kendrick. But that does not seem to be the case. But again, I can't say that for 100% certainty. I could actually only find a singular article outside of the police report that referenced this Facebook status. And this article says the post or the status was ruled out as a suspect and this was written in November 2013. During depositions for the wrongful death civil suit back in 2015, the Johnsons gave sworn testimony, during which Kenneth was asked about evidence he had to support the claim that his son was killed by Brian and Brandon Bell. He said that they have a lot to do with Kendrick's death, but he couldn't actually give any evidence to back up that point. Apparently, Kenneth and Jacqueline responded with I don't know or I do not recall more than 1,000 times during depositions, but they were still on Facebook spreading rumours about who was responsible for their son's death. You can see how this might get them in a bit of trouble from a legal standpoint. It was also revealed during these depositions that the infamous post-mortem photo of Kendrick, with his face swollen and bruised, looking like he'd been beaten up, was not taken at the school after he was released from the mat. I'm not going to include the photo in this video because it's a lot, it's very intense, but if you do want to see what I'm talking about, you can easily find it on Google. This photo was actually taken at the funeral home after the autopsy had already been done, not immediately upon his discovery. Faces and bodies change a lot in the hours and days after death. I mention it because the first time I looked at that photo, I thought it was obvious that Kendrick had been physically beaten. But if it was taken a few days post-mortem, I'm not too sure. But back to the bells. As we know, Kendrick was last seen walking into the school gym just after 1pm on the 10th of January. At this time, both Brian and Brandon are accounted for and the alibis are pretty airtight. According to video analysis conducted by the FBI, Brian was captured on camera walking along the exterior of the school towards the D-Wing at 1.28pm. Brian and Kendrick would have been travelling in opposite directions across the school towards their respective classes and likely would not have crossed paths on this journey. It also seems that Ryan Hall was located in the car park at this same time headed towards the J-Wing. He also probably wouldn't have crossed paths with Kendrick on his journey. If Kendrick had been attacked by these people after entering the gym at 1pm, this would give them less than 20 minutes to murder Kendrick and hide his body. Brandon Bell has an even stronger alibi as he was actually on a bus on his way to a wrestling match in Macken at the time, as testified by multiple witnesses, other people on the bus. The high school wrestling coach's phone records were even looked into to confirm exactly where the bus was at the time of Kendrick's death, and it was found that the record showed that the coach received an incoming call whilst in Cordell at 1.53pm. 
Cordell is about 85 miles north of Lowndes High School, meaning the bus would have had to have left the school at least an hour earlier, marking them as leaving the school before 1pm. However, at a press conference back in 2014, the Johnson family's attorney, Shane King, said in a statement they'd learned that the wrestling team had not left campus for a tournament that afternoon as previously thought. Apparently, there was a travel log which showed they departed for the trip at 4pm, not 1pm. However, it turns out this travel log was filed by the coach weeks before the trip, and in fact, 4pm was the way in time for the wrestlers. The match began at 4pm. This was not the time they intended to leave the school. If you're looking at all of that, you can probably say that it seems the Bells are completely innocent. How could Brandon have been in two places at once? Well, the argument from the Johnsons is that their father is an FBI agent and the video footage was reviewed by the FBI. Who's to say that he didn't have some sort of sway on the outcome of this? And this is a tricky argument because there's no way that I, as a regular person researching this on the internet, can say that this isn't what happened. But neither can I say that it is what happened. If he was an FBI agent with a lot of sway in the local area, if the local sheriff's office is perhaps a bit corrupt, I can see why that's something that could maybe in some world be plausible, but there's no actual proof of it. And there is an extra layer to this because Kendrick and the rest of his family are black and we're talking about the south of Georgia here, where racism is undeniably a problem, a huge systemic problem. How much of an influence could racism have had on this case? We can see why, as a black family, they would be concerned that the police wouldn't do a proper job on their son's case. We can see why that would be a concern for them. But there's no actual proof that their race, Kendrick's race, had anything to do with it. And as we know from the CNN article and the forensic video analysis that had a look at all the footage, the timestamps are there and they are correct, and there's a reason why the video would be jumpy. But why is there so much footage missing? Could it be that someone messed with it? It's really not out of the realm of possibility. But who would have done this? There are, without a doubt, inconsistencies in this case, questions that need to be answered. And I don't blame the Johnsons whatsoever in wanting to know exactly what happened to their son. I'm not quite as convinced as them about the Bell's involvement in this case. I feel like the CCTV footage proves that they were not with Kendrick at the time of his death. But there were rumours going around about one of the brothers confessing at their party in the July. And then there's the signed affidavit by Ryan Domek Hernandez. Affidavits aren't the gospel, of course, and there is the possibility that he's just lying. But what would he have to gain? There's also the fact that the second and third autopsies both show that Kendrick had been the victim of blunt force trauma. Why would this be so different from the first autopsy, unless the coroner was indeed influenced to put positional asphyxia on the report? Could it be that somebody's just innocently making a mistake here? Of course, but you'd hope not. And Kendrick's parents insist that there's no way that someone would have been able to fit inside the rolled up mat in the first place. His shoulders were 19 inches across and the hole was significantly smaller at just 14 inches. He would have very much struggled to fit inside there unless he fell inside with a hell of a lot of force, which seems unlikely. Maybe it makes more sense that he was rolled up in the mat in the aftermath of his death. And then there's the fact of his shoe, which was just sitting in a pool of blood but not covered with blood itself, almost as if the shoe had been placed there after Kendrick got hurt. So, like I said, there are plenty of inconsistencies in this case, questions that need answering. If this was my child, I would want those questions answered. The Johnsons have made some questionable decisions in what information they've released to the public via the Kendrick Johnson Facebook page and their attorney. They definitely got ahead of themselves at multiple points, but their constant campaigning and demand for justice have paid off, it seems. The original investigation was closed in 2016, five years ago, due to insufficient evidence. But at the beginning of March this year, it was announced that the case had finally been reopened, according to the new Lowndes County Sheriff, Ashley Polk. At the time of Kendrick's death, Polk was actually a retired former sheriff, but it seems that he's taken the helm once again from 2017. 
According to CNN, he said, if there's questions and they're legitimate, I need to know the answers myself. The only way I'm going to know is to look at the evidence myself. This goes as far back as April 2019, when he requested that information collected about this case during the federal investigation be released to his department, a request which was actually denied at the time. However, it seems a November 2020 visit by the Johnsons with federal investigators was a thing to make them grant the request. So now they've received 17 boxes of written and electronic devices from the federal investigation, including interviews, tens and thousands of emails and text messages, surveillance videos, and more. This new investigation is expected to take up to six months, but I have a feeling it will probably take longer than that because it always does. Polk doesn't seem to have any predisposition in this case, he just intends to review all of the information from the beginning with fresh eyes to see if they can discover anything new, treating it like a brand new investigation. It might get to the end with exactly the same outcome it previously had, that Kendrick's death was a tragic accident, or it could be murder. Karen Bell, Brian and Brandon's mother, has said to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, I just keep waiting for someone to be honest with the Johnsons, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. If the Bells are innocent in this case, as they currently are in the eyes of the law, then I can't imagine the distress this whole investigation has caused them. If they're not innocent, then I guess we'll find out. Polk has stated that he doesn't consider the Bell brothers or Ryan Hall to be suspects in this case. They haven't even determined if it was murder. If it was an accident, then of course there's no suspects. It seems that this will be the final investigation into this case. After this, it's probably done. And that's not even everything in regards to the most recent going-ons in this case. In an article on Oxygen from the 22nd of March 2021, just a couple of weeks ago, it's reported that there is apparently a new audio recording which contains a confession. The situation around this recording is admittedly a bit strange. Apparently the recording was provided to the Lowndes County Sheriff's Office after being purchased by the Johnson family from an individual who they don't know the name of. He gave a false name to the parents. The Sheriff's Office is actively hunting for the person that provided this recording and are investigating the origin and credibility of it. If this is a legitimate recording of a confession, then it could be absolutely huge for this case. But of course, this could also be a case of extortion, somebody taking advantage of a desperate family, someone who knows they'd be willing to pay money for an alleged confession. And Polk has said that if this is found to be false, the individual who sold it to them will be facing extortion charges. The recording hasn't been made public yet, as it is currently an active case, so they won't be divulging any of that information. However, the Johnsons have said that they're sure the clip is authentic. A spokesperson for them has said that it's a 25 second clip on which you can clearly hear what appears to be a young Caucasian male admitting very tearfully that he knows he's going to get caught. He makes that same statement twice. In conclusion to this video, I don't know where I stand on this case. I cannot confidently say either way whether I think Hendrick's death was a tragic accident or a murder. I do struggle to believe that the Bells are responsible for this purely because of the surveillance footage that shows them elsewhere at the time. That's a pretty indisputable alibi. But I also don't think that the Johnsons' claims that the FBI or other law enforcement could have altered the footage is completely out of the realm of possibility. I'm very intrigued to see what the reopening of this case brings and I'll be sure to update you all as soon as there's any more information in this case that could lead to a possible answer. If this new recording is found to be authentic, then that is absolutely huge. This case is just an absolute minefield and I really hope I did a good job at providing a very rounded view of this case, looking at it from both sides. Please let me know what you think or if you think there's anything I missed in the comments down below. Thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you next week. Bye guys.